Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this panel on Alfred Arteaga's collected poems, Chican Quicato. Um, the book um, is the object of our panel, um, but we're also celebrating the life and the writings of all kinds of Alfred today with a group of panelists who knew Alfred in various capacities, who know his work, and uh, who's various perspectives on Alfred we hope will open up um, both his life and his significance um, to a wider audience than he achieved at an earlier point uh, during his own life. Um, my name is David Lloyd. I'm a professor of English at the University of California Riverside and I was for many years a colleague and for even longer fortunately a friend of Alfred Arteaga's and today I'm the chair and moderator of our round table. In fall 2020, Wesleyan University Press published Arteaga's Chican Quicatl, Collected Poems, which I have the honor to edit and which opens with a preface by Cherie Moraga, who joins us here today and who'll kick off our panel. Shikan Quicatl gathers together for the first time the work of this highly innovative Shikanex poet, critic, teacher, and cultural activist who died tragically and young in 2008. From the Chicano moratorium of 1970 to the struggle against California's Propositions 187 and 209 in the 1990s, Arteaga was always engaged in the resistance to white supremacy and anti-immigrant and anti-indigenous demagogy. At the same time, his multilingual, formerly innovative poetry constantly explored the boundaries of a poetic language that was infused with the experience of border crossing, language mixing and clashing, cultural mestizaje, fusions of indigenous and settler, of what he termed crossing exing or crossing of all kinds from what he called the tricks of gender crossing to the literal crossing of borders and the borders that crossed peoples. As a critic, he theorized the extraordinary traditions of Mexican American writing, and in particular, the Chicano Renaissance of the 1960s through the 1990s. As a teacher too, he mentored and inspired several generations of undergraduates and graduates. His creativity in all these fields was the expression of an always insubordinate commitment to revolt. This round table brings together a number of participants who knew and worked with or on Arteaga in order to discuss the significance of his work for these times in which his concerns seem more relevant and timely than ever. This round table is being recorded and will be posted on the American Studies Association's Freedom Courses YouTube channel after this event. In order not to overload people's Wi-Fi and to keep our panelists visible on the main screen, please keep your video off and your sound muted at least until the panel concludes. In the meantime, please use the chat box for any questions or comments you'd like to offer. And after the recorded session is over, you're welcome to stay on for a free form conversation about Alfred and his work. Before we proceed, let me first of all thank the ASA and its president Dylan Rodriguez for giving us this opportunity to discuss Alfred's work in the context of the ASA's now remote conference. I also want to thank Wesleyan University Press for the incredibly beautiful book that they produced, which I hope people will take the opportunity to look at online and hopefully to buy. Uh, for the first time in my life, I'm able to promote a book because I don't feel it's my work, it's somebody else's, and that's a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, let me also thank, uh, finally, our two wonderful uh, ASL interpreters, um, Tricia and William, uh, who will be uh, signing the whole event all the way through. Um, so thank you both very much indeed for the work that you're doing for us. Let me now introduce the participants who are going to speak in the order in which I'm presenting them now, and uh, which I will post in the chat, if I can find it, um, momentarily. 
First of all, uh, Cherie Moraga, professor of English at UC Santa Barbara, is an internationally recognized poet, playwright, essayist, and memoirist. She kindly contributed a beautiful preface to Shikan Quicatl that is also a moving memorial to Alfred and the movement of Shikanex poets and writers of which he was a part. Carolina Gonzalez is a recovering academic. Is it possible to recover? Uh, an ac a recovering academic and a journalist, careers that intertwined in her time in the PhD program in comparative literature at UC Berkeley, where Alfred, of course, taught for many years. Originally from New York and Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, she lives in Brooklyn, New York, and works for the labor union 32BJ SEIU, which represents building service workers. Her own poems, written in collaboration with Alfred Cartas, are included in Chican Quicato. Thank you, Carolina. Jose Anguiano is associate professor of Chicanx Latinx studies at Cal State Los Angeles. He had the privilege of being Alfred Arteaga's undergraduate student in literature and creative writing courses in the early 2000s at UC Berkeley. Melissa Mora Hidalgo, adjunct instructor at CSU Long Beach and CSU Fullerton, was introduced to Alfred and his work as an undergraduate also in English at UC Berkeley in the 1990s. And Dorothy Wang, associate professor in the American Studies program at Williams College, knew Alfred Arteaga and his work as a graduate student at UC Berkeley. She's the author of Thinking Its Presence, Form, Race, and Subjectivity in Contemporary Asian American Poetry. Craig Dworkin, professor of English at the University of Utah, knew Alfred at Berkeley and learned from him as both a poet and a scholar. Laura Elisa Perez met Alfred shortly after her arrival at UC Berkeley in 1994-1995. Her journey has been blessed by his friendship and his example of creativity and in intellectual and spirit-led poet work. She and Alfred shared a love of Mexica Mesoamerican philosophy and aesthetics. His explorations of the difrasismo, the diaphragm, deeply echoed in her first book, Chicana Art, the Politics of Spiritual and Aesthetic Altarities, as a way also of signifying the hybridity of Western and non-Western aesthetics and spiritualities. It's good to be able to say that in the fall of 2019, Duke University Press published her Eros Ideologies, Writings on Art, Spirituality, and the Decolonial. And then in the fall of 2019, is that 2020? We'll be publishing her co-edited anthology, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, Art, Weaving, Vision. And finally, but absolutely not least, my friend and colleague Richard T. Rodriguez is Associate Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California. He was a student of Alfred's at Berkeley and a longtime friend. Welcome everybody to this round table and Cherie, I pass it over to you. Um, well, thank you, uh, David, for all of this, you know, for all the work. I want to kind of roll away for a minute so you can see my picture of Alfred. And um, I lit a candle for him. Um, I feel like um, this is not just a intellectual pursuit that we're all doing here, but it really is about calling, calling Alfred, you know, calling him down if he dares to deign to do that, <laughs> he must be, you know, just like wherever our spirits are, he must be in a really good place as he really deserves it. But if, should he so desire to pay us a visit, I just want to light one candle and say, you know, bienvenido, hermano, you know, I love Alfred a lot. And um, I just also just want to really honor David when he said, you know, that he said, um, that this is really Alfred's work. This, this collection is just so beautifully put together. And it really is, you know, David Lloyd's act of love and commitment and friendship to him. So I really honor him too for, for that. So I'll, I'm gonna read from the foreword. And um, the title is Time Stretched and then in parentheses, Too Thin, and that's a quote. And then another quote from Alfred, take the interior of zero, end quote. 
Alfred Arteaga invites and I enter. In the short two decades of knowing Alfred, I first met the pages of his work with a kind of awe, imagining him, the poet, occupying the world of his myriad travels, languages, relationships, meetings and departures with a certain bravado I never could have dreamed. I fantasized what it might be like to be that free, a large light-skinned and bearded man trotting the globe. But somehow Alfred always remained tethered to the rest of us, the smaller in stature, the browner, the female, not by duty, but by the pure knowing he'd be lost without us. A humility embedded into the very heart of Alfred Arteaga's Chicanismo in poetry. As she connects, we are always on the brink of a particular kind of disappearance. On both sides of the border, we are often an unacknowledged, forgotten people whose right to be as we are is at times publicly questioned. Arteaga's poetry and criticism would name us again and again as inheritors of the original impulse of American literature, the flor y canto in Xochit Inquicat of the Nahua scribes and their descendants. Like the hummingbird that, quote, can fly backwards, end quote, Alfred was, take, was tasked to look back and so doing, conceived a multilingual Chicanex languaging, which in some way anticipates a still unimaginable global future. The visionary collection of writings this is, which David Lloyd has faithfully brought into being reflects the very mestizaje of Arteaga's imaginings, bound by an American indigenous perspective where the temporal and spatial spiral off of elemental, spiral off of one another to tell story as the body remembers it, where the elements remain elemental and where sand and ocean meet and wind crosses continents to bind and separate. Here, fire is sex and arrow at once. Arteaga's work is unsurpassed in capturing the pure ephemerality and landed beauty that is Chicanex poetry spoken, danced, and painted. If the truth be told, it took me weeks to absorb the plethora of polylingual reflection and invention presented in this text. I read each of its nearly 300 pages employing my first generation educated English, a Spanish I'm only half good at, a French I know nothing of, and a self-taught Nahuatl fairly restricted to the Aztec pantheon of people and place. Still reading Chican Cuicatl felt wholly familiar in that the bifurcation and blending of languages is the Chicanex lingua franca in the Southwest as it was in my own childhood home where Spanish and English and Spanglish traveled across four generations of comprehension. This book is not one to easily consume. It requires at least a good month's reading where one might turn and return to a passage every few days or so to allow the lines to reside within the reader and perhaps change the reader for the better, the truer. This is the work and hope of literature, language that resonates within a person to such a degree that it generates meaning from what before had seemed meaningless. There is much to consider here in these pages from within and without. In Arteaga's Chicanex imagination, there are no borders from ocean to ocean, from Berkeley to Belfast, or Ben Bull Ben. Meanwhile, the poet concedes geopolitical borders break bodies. He writes of touch and its relationship to power. How is it the border between the untouchables and the touched are created? He asks, who gets touched? Who matters? Who doesn't get touched? Or who is touched too late? In 
is the Chican Cuicat creates a portrait of Atlan and its citizens in the act of touching across time and place. From the Chicano Moratorium of 1970 in East Los Angeles to a gathering among Chicano and Chicana artists and poets in San Francisco some 25 years later. Arteaga describes that mid 1990s mo moment as our Chicano Renaissance. I too was in attendance. His celebration of artists and writers paradoxically presages the illnesses and deaths of many of those celebrated that evening. Perhaps a Chicanex artist, this is the foundation of our discrocasia, displaced from time, displaced from a timeline, Alfred called the disease. Did he mean history? To allow of Alfred Arteaga's work to enter you is to be transported into the wholeness of zero, that timeless sight that one may find in the most grounded of meditative moment, moments. To read this work is to enter that sight, to be animated with consciousness in an awakened sensorial body. It is to recognize the ephemeral location of spirit and its ever presence. It is to read and write and live in anticipation of your own road home to the underworld of Mixlan. The poet writes, quote, Se bien de donde vengo, y más o menos a que hora acabaré, end quote. Did he? Did Alfred as Lactmantini know the hour of his death, that quote, hue of time stretched so suddenly thin, end quote, in his own life, time and space. In this book, Alfred writes before the edge of the world, the Pacific looking west. I too join him there and watch the waves return and recede to and from our shared California homeland. December 2019, Santa Barbara, Anisquicoyo. Uh, Carolina, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of people who, to thank, including everybody who's on this call. Um, I, I, I recognize some of the names of the folks that are in uh, the audience, uh, the virtual audience, and um, it's very gratifying to see that the same way that Alfred used to bring us together and he used to cross us when he was with us, He's still bringing us together and crossing us and making us cross, um, you know, from wherever he is. Um, and uh, the responsibility I feel, or the, or you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to not be nervous about the fact that I'm trying to follow Cherie. Uh, Cherie's a very tough act to follow, always has been. And um, but I, I do really want to express my gratitude to um, you know everyone who made this book happen, everybody who, you know, in the friendship that we had um, with Alfred is keeping, you know, is keeping him alive and will keep him alive. Um, you know, I first, I, I met Alfred on my first semester in Berkeley and uh, I, sadly, I did the math and it's 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, we really just kind of hit it off right away, both at a personal level and an intellectual level, you know, in part because I came to Berkeley as somebody with deep ambivalence about being in, you know, being in graduate school. I, I, I was deeply ambivalent about um, wanting to be in this academic life and but being in academia, which, you know, um, was and continues to be an incredibly, you know, frankly, hostile place to people who are haven't already agreed to sign on to all um, the rules. I mean, it, it, it does feel it did feel a lot of times like a pact with the, you know, that that's sort of like pact with the devil. Uh, you're signing off on all these things. Um, I, I, I do feel like things have 
if if there's anything that comes out of this past year um, that has been positive is really feeling the idea that all those things that a lot of us um, swallowed um, in those days uh, maybe can be broken. Um, and I am sorry that Alfred isn't here with us to see it. So, so in that ambivalence that I felt coming to Berkeley, uh, meeting Alfred was, you know, uh, it was a lifesaver in a lot of ways. Um, there were other people, uh, you know, at Berkeley who were part of this, you know, really uh, great sort of resistance from within. David was also part of that for sure. Um, and you know, I think that meeting him and getting to know his work, both as a poet and as an, um, and as a scholar was incredibly helpful to me because it gave me um, a new vocabulary and a new syntax, a vocabulary for, you know, how to talk about some of these feelings I was having and some of these experiences, um, but also a new way of like, you know, not being afraid to have all these languages and all these experiences that I had cross each other and meet each other and be and and the idea that you could be suspended among all these different uh, places and feelings and things and ways of being um, was incredibly helpful to me and got and basically you know got me through my first incredibly difficult year of graduate school um, and the idea that it was okay to have this side that was creative and also, you know, really geeky theoretical, um, and at the and all and at the same time without forgetting um, the politics. That was incredibly liberating and and gave me um, a lot of permission. And you know, and I think one of the things that you see in Alfred's writing, other than this sort of you know, just again, incredibly erudite but fearlessly erudite, like not embarrassed to be erudite um, way of um, expressing like his reality, our reality. Um, the other thing that you see a lot is the sense of play, which, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, it's like, I still remember that uh, just early on, like calling him and then it's like, he's like, okay, okay, listen to this. And then in the background, he hits play and um, hearing uh, Fabulosos Cadillacs uh, Matador, which again, it did this whole thing of, uh, I mean, I, I you know I'm totally dating myself with that, but um, it did this whole thing of like, again, combining joy and politics and cross culture um, uh, references and history and, and everything. Um, and I guess the, I guess like, I, I am going to try to keep my, my, um, my comments a bit short, but I just want to talk a little bit about, just give a little bit of context to, um, the project that, you know, again, Ricky Rodriguez very graciously mentioned to David and, uh, ended up as part of the book, um, in 1992, which if you remember was the quincentenary, uh, was this, you know, year of, again, a lot of movement and breakage in the world, um, in, in this continent at least. Uh, that year, I um, ended up back in the Dominican Republic for the first time since, you know, I had been a kid. So it was my first time there as an adult in basically the scene of the crime. It's It was, you know, in the first European settlement in the Americas. Um, Again, having a lot of mixed feelings about, you know, continuing with this academic career, uh, while at the same time very excited about the kinds of research I was doing, um, but you know, just having a lot, having a lot of feelings for sure. And um, you know, uh, for those of you who are who like are too young, uh, this was a this was pre this was actually even pre email. This was pre email. Like I remember my first uh, email account was in 1994, so 1992-93 was pre-email. So Alfred and I um, would write each other letters. Um, some of them were handwritten, I still have all of them. Some of them were handwritten, some of them were typed, uh, but it wasn't this email, it wasn't this, you know, immediate communication. And I think, I think that the poem exchanged 
started, I think, with like the third letter that we crossed. Uh, because I, I was telling him, I was like, look, I'm going through a lot and I'm trying to process. And one of the ways that I'm trying to process is that I'm going back to writing poetry and I want to write and I'm trying to write it all in Spanish. And so I sent him this one poem I was trying and then he sends me something back. Uh, and it's funny that Cherie started, uh, had mentioned before that it's raining in California right now because the first poem is about how it was raining in California after there had been this very long drought. Um, as somebody from the tropics, um, it just was this, in, you know, and but having lived in California for many years at that time, it was this, um, again, this sort of like crossing of time and space of the rain that I'm seeing in the tropics that is a very common everyday quotidian thing is suddenly in California where it's uh, a miracle, you know? Um, and, you know, I think both of us at that particular moment were going through, uh, we're working out a lot of things in, in our uh, personal lives and in our uh, professional lives. And the process of, and we just kind of fell into this process of like, oh, we're just gonna write each other poems every time we send each other a letter. And you know, by the end of the year that I was in um, in the Dominican Republic, you know, it it actually amounted to you know like a chapbook. Uh, and we had talked many times about just publishing it and just never got around to it. So it's incredibly gratifying to see it published finally as you know a unit. Um, but also seeing the po his poems separate in the way that he did publish them, it just really made me realize how um, inconsistently consistent he was uh, and how many of the themes that he was working out in that project are themes that he worked on throughout his poetic life. Um, so I, you know, I definitely feel that uh, I am not, even though I'm not in academia anymore, uh, I definitely feel that my intellectual formation, and, and I would even say my spiritual formation, even though I think he would resist having any claim on anybody's spiritual formation, um, I, I do feel that I owe Alfred a lot in that. Um, so I'm gonna leave it leave it there for now. Thank you. And thank you so much to David. He, It's like, you know, the amount of time that you, put, you know, the care and amount of time and like as Cherie said, love that you put into, you know, get making this to happen. It's like, I, I am deeply grateful for it. Thank you, Carolina. Um, it was a labor of love and of mourning, but now happily of celebration. So <laughs> let me with that pass it over to Jose Angriano. Jose. Yes, thank, thank you, David. And uh, first, I just want to, you know, thank everybody for sharing this virtual space together today. Um, I want to thank Ricky Rodriguez, who was the first one to mention this panel to me and was like, hey, maybe you want to be part of this. So thank you, Ricky. Thank you, David, for organizing this and for, and for the invitation to join. And um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of briefly share today some recollections of one of my favorite all-time professors, Alfred Arteaga, right? And I felt like I never got a chance to say goodbye to him. I never got a chance to, to talk with him after I left UC Berkeley in the mid 2000s. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some of, some of my thoughts and recollections of working with him during, during that, those years. So thank you again. And thank you again for all the ASA uh, mentors, colleagues and, and uh, other friends I see in the, in the virtual audience. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I met Alfred in 2001 when I transferred to UC Berkeley from a community college in Orange County. I was a Chicano studies major where Chicano literature taught by Alfred was one of the required courses. Eventually, I also pursued a creative writing minor where I took additional courses with Alfred. My memories of Alfred close to 20 years later are fragments of his presence, pieces of fleeting feelings that are still with me. I recall that uh, several times in his upper division literature courses, if you stayed after and talked to him just long enough, he would inevitably invite you to a drink on Telegraph Avenue. He always offered to pay, of course. 
One time, I remember too, he invited about 10 of us in the class out for a beer. He of course paid again. He was the first and only professor that I ever met that did that. Uh, that's the Alfred that I remember. When I met him, he had this bohemian attitude about life and, the, and a deep, gruff laugh. Um, in reading the, the foreword for the book, um, I was actually surprised to learn about Alfred's battle with tenure because when I got a chance to take courses with him in the, in the, in the early to mid 2000s, he never talked about that. He never mentioned that. So it was, so I was, so it was also kind of amazing to learn more about him through this collection. But that's why I remember this bohemian attitude of, of life, this deep gruff laugh. He never seemed to care for distinctions between himself and those around him. And he was always eager to know who we were, where we came from. He was always asking us questions. In high school, I had studied French, not Spanish, like most of my Chicano friends. So when I took his course and read his poems with all his clever puns in French, I felt validated that Chicanos could be interested and fluent in multiple languages, not just Spanish, but also not well in French and many other languages. And here's another key thing I forever admire about Alfred. He was somehow simultaneously grounded in Chicano culture and the Chicano movement, and at the same time, a citizen of the world. He would amuse us with stories about Ireland, Paris, Madrid, and Mexico City. In one moment, he was explaining to us the use of the letter X in Nahuatl, and next, he was talking about his favorite pubs in Dublin. Alfred Arteaga was the first poet I ever met. Growing up in an immigrant working class neighborhood, my love of books was encouraged by my parents, but I did not have any role models to follow necessarily. In third grade, I remember when I asked a librarian for, for quote unquote classic novels to read, she gave me books such as The Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, and Moby Dick. I devoured those books, but I never saw myself in them, nor did they encourage me to write my own stories. In my courses with Alfred, I saw a model for being a writer and academic that I didn't know was possible. The cleverness of his poems and the elegance of his arguments sealed the deal for me. This is what I wanted for myself too. Learning from Alfred inspired me to become a creative writing minor after taking some classes with him, if only to satisfy a gnawing energy to write for myself. Alfred had a completely carefree attitude about his, about his classes when I was with him. 20 of us would sit in a circle and workshop pieces, but only if we wanted. He never forced us to write. He never forced us to share anything we didn't want to share. Half the time, we peppered him with questions about his writing method. And what was it like to live the life of a poet, we always asked him. Uh, here, we heard a lot more about those pubs in Ireland again. And of course, also many other adventures. In these classes, I recall I wrote a sappy short story about a reddish cow named La Colorada that my father owned as a young man in Mexico. It was a story of secondhand memories, grainy photos, and immigrant despair. This poor cow did not make it to the end of my story. Only much later would I realize my father had shared his own version of Juan Rufo's short story um, called It's Because, They're so, it's because We're So Poor where a lost calf named La Serpentina is a metaphor for sudden and cruel loss. And I just remember it was terrifying to present something so personal, but Alfred never couched his responses in terms of your writing is good or your writing is bad, but instead he always pushed us to dig deeper in the details and feelings of a piece. This is a lesson I forever took with me even as my writing ultimately went towards academic writing. Learning from professors like Alfred, and of course, I also have to mention, I see Laura Perez was one of my, my, my professors as well. Uh, I see Jose David Saldivar in the audience. So learning from, from folks like this, um, they ultimately, and of course, Alfred ultimately taught me that our stories matter and that they have every right to be heard and read in the world, no matter what genre we are writing in. Alfred was the first poet I ever met, and perhaps he may be the last. So I just want to say thank you, Maestro, and thank you all for allowing me to share some of these recollections and memories. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And I remember visiting one of Alfred's 
creative writing classes and I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, now over to Melissa Hidalgo. Hi. Thank you again, everybody, to my old professor, David Lloyd, who's classes introduced me to work by Arteaga and Moraga and many others and um, just honored again to be here um, to have received the invitation from my professor in Berkeley so many years ago uh, to honored that, that you remembered me David and, and honored also that I that you felt like I had something to contribute to this so thank you for that um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I am in Whittier right now, that's where I live, born and raised in Montebello down Beverly Boulevard, down the street from where Al Alfred Arteaga grew up. And I still have the original version of Gantos that Professor Lloyd assigned to us in 95, 96. So I'm also dating myself as well. <laughs> and, you know, as a young English major, you know, bright eyed, wishy-tailed, you know, wanting to learn everything and, and anything I could as this young public school student from Whittier, from La Habra or OC Borderlands, you know, automatically a child of the Borderlands, uh, having grown up in, in East Whittier and also La Mirada, La Habra, La Mirada area. I grew up knowing really quick what it meant to sort of be from a border without realizing what that meant until one goes to school, you know, and, and teachers, Anglo teachers start mis presenting your last name, but then automatically assume that you speak Spanish to the new kid who just came in. And I'm the pocha who's like, what? Like, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Uh, so, so there were a lot of deep connections that this young student felt uh, in this work, not just with Boraga's work, who I also read in the same class, speaking to this young, you know, very much like how Jose just spoke beautifully about, you know, seeing a poet for the first time kind of, right? And sort of realizing that I, you know, a poet came from where I was born to and grew up to, you know, an East Los Chicano poet it was such a special thing. And so special that when I went to the back and, and I saw that in his bio that he was, you know, born in East LA and raised in Whittier, that's one of the first things I underlined, you know, I was so excited to go home and tell my mom. So it was with this kind of joy, you know, I, I never, you know, I didn't take a class with Artega. So I feel like I'm, I'm kind of the outlier in this group. You know, I didn't know him in the way that some of you did. I didn't work with him or take creative writing classes. In fact, I was, you know, I think too busy reading Ulysses or something and, you know, with, with David a, a few times and, and because, but, but I will say that there were so many things that resonated with me in Cantos and to now 25 some odd years later as, as a grown, grown-ish person now with a good 20, 25 years of being an English major and profe in Chicano literature and Chicano studies and sort of doing my own reading, my own writing, my own traveling, the honor of, of kind of coming back and being reacquainted with his work. I feel like I get so much out of it, so much more out of it now, you know, and not what I didn't, you know, not that what I got out of it when I was younger was not anything. And in fact, I, I would argue that those were the seeds um, in many ways that were planted that ended up sprouting a good 25 years later as I found myself in Ireland on a Fulbright <laughs> studying Chicano, Mexican, Irish, literary, cultural affinities and connections. And, you know, as I was preparing my comments for this panel, Ireland, you know, obviously uh, plays a big role in his writing. It was something I had shared with David a few days ago that this is where I feel really drawn to um, having just spent, you know, about four years ago coming back from Ireland, I was there in Limerick uh, at the University of Limerick for six months. And I saw from across the pond what happened to this country in 2016 with the elections and, and having to see it from far away was so painful. Um, the literature, you know, I, I, this is where I read my Chicano writers, right? When I was in, 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 in Ireland, you know, I was reading Moraga again, I was reading Arteaga again, I was reading Elena Maria Viramontes again, because there was something about being in Ireland. And I happened to have been at a conference at the University of Maynooth uh, November 9th, I think, the morning right after the election, and we were eight hours ahead in Ireland. So, you know, we're just seeing the news break. And, and I happened to be at a conference with a bunch of professors who studied Chicano Latino literature. It was a conference on film, I think, a Chicano uh, Latin American film. So there were a lot of these convergences that I didn't know I would find myself in at the moment. And at the same time, I felt very grateful that I had this kind of Chicano, Chicana family in a place like Ireland 
that really was routed through this literature and, and these kind of literary pathways that for me were really charted out way back when I was an English major. Um, and kind of looking back and thinking about some of the um, things that, that stood out to me were, you know, areas and cantos where um, Alfred uh, writes about, for example, John Riley and, and the San Patricios um, and, and the line, for example, uh, from Green Terra Island to Green Tenochtitlan Island, from Aaron to Aslan, I remember then. And then coming to the house uh, with the blue bed a, a little bit later on and seeing on one page, you know, him mention Galway and Sligo and Whittier Boulevard and Baja Mexico. I mean, literally line after line. And, and, and there are a couple of things that came to my mind, you know, on the one hand, going back and thinking about uh, what I felt like when I was there in Limerick, experiencing dislocatia, right? Dislocasia, however it is that we might pronounce it. And what I then attempted to as well was sort of really trying to ground myself and locate myself. And, you know, what I take from Alfred's work, especially now, uh, you know, with some uh, travels and, and writings under my belt and explorations under my belt, is the incredible necessity for a transnational vision like this, right? For the kind of these transnational conversations to happen at this time and place. If we're talking about the border in Mexico and the US, we can also talk about the border in Northern Ireland that's under assault with Brexit, you know, kind of uh, those kinds of conversations. If we wanna talk about literary trajectories, we can talk about the kind of colonial education that a lot of us had to kind of route ourselves through in order to arrive back at Chicano and Chicana literary writing. You know, I was one of those English majors that studied Victorian literature and then was like, whoa, what am I doing here? And then I kind of find the Fenians in Ireland and I'm thinking, okay, that sounds a little better. And I find James Joyce <laughs> and then I find the Virgin Mary. I'm like, okay, they got the Virgin, right? It's good, I'm close. And I felt like I had to go so far to come back home. But yet here I am going back out there to, to make sense of home, right? And I, and I really resonated um, with this concept of dislocasia for that reason. And I'll just say one more thing before moving on. Um, it, it, you know, not just the conversation around borders, I think just the, the themes that his work touches, borders obviously, uh, for, for me, his travels around Ireland and um, you know, going to the Bobby Sands um, grave and, and really putting together these transnational, transcontinental movements against oppression. Um, but also one of the first things that, you know, in thinking about dislocasia and feeling displaced from time and space, one of the things that struck, strikes me, continues to strike me about his work is, is his insistence on mapping. And I felt like I just wanted to pull a map out when I was rereading his stuff to ground myself, right? Because time and space and temporality, especially with those of us now in the pandemic experiencing life and like warp speed or like really slow speed, um, this idea, this notion of dislocasia, I think for me is really, um, it's something I'm gonna hold on to and, and, and sit with for a while because uh, it's such a, it's such a, it, it speaks specifically to what I think so many of us are feeling um, in this moment. And the, the, I'll just say one more thing. I, when I was there at UC Berkeley, you know, as an undergrad, I had no idea what was happening sort of, you know, at that level as far as his tenure uh, denial and all of that. And so his poems on academia and specifically his poem Tomorrow Today on Affirmative Action could have been written today. You know, California may have voted for Joe Biden, but they also voted to, to not overturn the ban on affirmative action. So um, I just want to kind of end there and again express my gratitude, you know, that I wish I could talk to Alfred and, and kind of reintroduce myself to him and, and, and tell him thank you for his work that speaks so much and so deeply to all of us. So, gracias. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the memories. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to be said about Alfred in Ireland, including the fact that there are no hummingbirds there. Uh, <laughs> I want to pass the baton now to Dorothy Wang, who I think may even have been in the same class, but we'll find out. Hi, um, thank you, David, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. And thanks to all the other, the fellow panelists and the people attending. Actually, like Melissa, I didn't have, a, I didn't actually know Alfred in a really deep personal way, um, only tangentially, but his life and his work um, have left their marks on me. So I actually wrote out my comment. So I apologize in advance for reading because I'm going to turn, I have it on a laptop, which I have to turn slightly to the side, which is why I'm not looking directly at the camera. Um, 
when I think of Alfred, I automatically am brought back to my graduate school days at Berkeley in the 1990s. And for some reason, I always picture Wheeler Hall when I think of him, and be not because he belonged there in the sense of belonging, but because there was something disciplinary and soul killing about the space and the English department it housed. Um, in the trajectory of Alfred's subsequent move from Wheeler to Barrows Hall, which housed ethnic studies, one could sense something that desired air and life or simply the right to live and write. I'm ashamed to say that I never took a class with Alfred, but he was always warm and friendly to me. I wish I had taken a class with him. I hadn't read much of his poetry at the time. What struck me as a graduate student was that he was a Chicano scholar who taught Shakespeare. The novelty of that was I'm sure what gave him token validity in the neoliberal regime of that department. When I speak about Alfred now, 31 years after I started at Berkeley, I am struck by how ahead of his time he was. And both, how, and both how much has changed since he was driven out of the English department and how much still remains to be done, by which I mean decolonized in English departments, the field of literary studies and the field of poetry studies. There was an enormous chasm between English and ethnic studies then, and perhaps even now I haven't been back to Berkeley for a long time. All the prestige of working on English um, literature accrued to the literary new historicist celebs in English and their scholarly rag representations. And to the theorists and rhetoric and comp lit. Ethnic studies was seen by English as the discredited stepchild, uh, a community center posing as an academic department. The irony of course now is that some of the most high profile theorists working today came out of Berkeley's ethnic studies department. Where was there a place for an experimental poet who trained in Renaissance literature, had a political conscience and wrote multilingual poetry? As Sheree Moraga writes in her foreword, Alfred did not trade on his light skin to cozy up to the white power structure of the English department. He was one of a small group of scholars and writers on campus, mostly of color, who stood for alternative ways of thinking about literature and its intrinsic links to society. Thinking of June Jordan, whom I TA'd for, Barbara Christian, Ishmael Reed, Oscar Campomanes, Abdul Jal Muhammad, and of course, David Lloyd, my, who, was, who is, was my dissertation advisor. I ask myself today, why did I take Stephen Greenblatt's course on New World Wonder or whatever it was called instead of Alfred's courses? Why did I go to another white man, a poetry scholar that all the clever boys worked under about my proposed dissertation topic on Asian American poetry instead of Alfred? That same scholar responded to my desire to focus on Asian Amer American poets with the question, haven't the Chicanos done all that already? Greenblatt was, of course, the star of the Berkeley English Department in, in the 1990s, the other Renaissance scholar who also wrote on the New World, but chose to focus on its wondrous flora and fauna as seen through the white conquistador's libidinous gaze. When we read Columbus's diaries in his class, he was silent on the multiple accounts of torture and mutilation of indigenous peoples. When I asked him in office hours why we weren't discussing these passages, he remarked, I'm not interested in unproductive guilt. Am I supposed to give back the land my house is built on in San Francisco? I'm told that he also wondered out loud in a faculty meeting about whether there was such a thing as Filipino literature. I'm sure he felt the same way about Chicano literature. Yet history has many ways posing its own arc. They and rightfully racist musings are firmly located on the wrong side of history. While Alfred's work retains its relevance and importance, his work in many ways prescient resonates so much with what young BIPOC scholars care about today. For example, in the poem Textos Vivos, in the side and black and each other, manifestations of one violence. In her work today, like the great poet Aimé Césaire, makes new language break the imperial of English and to create cracks in colonial ideologies and aesthetics, opening new possibilities for poets beyond the provinciality of English literature as officially recognized in the academy. Poetry, perhaps most of all the poetry of Shakespeare is saturated in blood. We all still live in the midst of the global violence that started over half a millennium ago. In the poem Tomorrow Today, Alfred writes of quote, the most severe genocide in the history of the world. Yet all is not doom and gloom. He also writes movingly of the natural world of the texture of sand and the wondrous beauty of hummingbirds. 
His lyric impulse works alongside and with his theoretical restlessness and his deep interest in, and his deep interest in linguistic experimentation. As much as these poems traverse geographical locations, they are also aesthetically adventurous, often wryly playful with a tinge of melancholy. A California native, Alfred writes in Cantos, Canto Pacifico of quote, the ocean's most wild dance against the sandstone cliffs of Santa Cruz, and then moves without fanfare to the torture and death of Victor Yara. Poetry must be able to contain various types of facticity because the world contains multiple realities. I wish, like Melissa, Alfred were still here so I could walk beside him and talk to him about all the things I was unable to grasp or appreciate as a graduate student at Berkeley, brainwashed as I still was in the anglophilic ether of Wheeler Hall, trying to make sense of the professionalized realm of literature. David Lloyd has given us a gift in this volume of collected poems, a great act of friendship and love. In these collected poems, I filled Alfred's living hand, hand, warm and capable, reaching out to us, red life streaming through it, giving us sustenance and the hope for a future in which being a BIPOC person, loving Shakespeare, reading Derrida, writing in other languages, protesting against colonial ideologies and legacies would not cause one's heart literally to break. Thank you, Alfred, for putting your life's blood into your poems so that we may breathe a little more freely. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for that account. And um, as Shuri says in the chat, la lucha continua. <laughs> We're not done yet with that Imperial English department, but we will be. And uh, you were there to see it. Thank you. Um, uh, Craig Dworkin is our next speaker, Craig. Uh, let me first just acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from unceded Shoshone lands and Ute ancestral lands. Um, and let me also thank you, David, uh, for including me today. I'm immensely honored um, and proud to be in this company. Alfred, um, you know, was important to me in, in some different ways, personally um, and professionally, and uh, most of all, really as a writer. So lots of things I might um, say, I think, in, in celebration, but I thought I'd highlight one aspect of his writing, and this is both in the poetry and in uh, the scholarship that exemplifies the literary politics of, uh, of its moment, this late 1980s, early 1990s moment, um, which has taken a complete 180 degree turn recently. Uh, and so, which I think might be worth revisiting um, in general on the occasion of revisiting Alfred's writing in particular. Um, and the characteristic I have in mind is especially legible against the quite explicit, stark uh, Hegelian dialectic that Alfred deploys to such effect, um, but without, and this is the point I wanna emphasize, without reifying either the thesis or the antithesis. So that the idea of Mestizo, for instance, escapes reinforcing either the sense of indigenous or Iberian purity, which it might otherwise risk um, doing. And so if, if you look at essays like um, uh, Beasts and Jagged Strokes of Color, it's about the poetics of hybridization, both the poetry analyzed there, but also the critical intellect on display are characterized by um, performative, constructivist, tentative effects, what he calls, um, quote, um, poetry of refraction that breaks up the possibility of a monologic vision um, that disrupts homogeneity and stasis. And the language of value in these essays and the locus of uh, Alfred's critical and poetic attention uh, falls to, quote, destabilizing by focusing on the name as a discursive act that's open to interpretation. I think we might hear language there um, in general for name, focusing on language as this discursive act that is open to interpretation. And indeed, in just, in just the span of one, uh, one page here um, on the poetics of hybridization yields, um, transgression, uh, eluding, blurring, obscurity, resistance to codification, resistance to fixity, 
uh, resistance to what, quote, could be grasped and processed. So the focus is not on be processed, but on uh, process rather than essence. The work's focused on the continuous, the unfinished, um, the unfinalized, uh, and always, and this comes back to being open to interpretation, um, always a focus on what is, quote, difficult to discuss. Um, and I think we could assemble these odes to indeterminacy from almost any page of um, Chicano poetics, uh, the subtitle heterotexts and hybridities uh, signals as much. Um, but the book concludes uh, the last line, the last essay on late epic um, with the language of identity. Um, I don't even have to look at this one, quote, not as a state of being, but rather as an act. Uh, and the act performed there, uh, like Velimir Klebnikov's uh, poetic linguistics of internal declensions is a decidedly poetic act. Uh, the infinitive shikar, meaning to play, to conflict, to work out dialogically unfinalized versions of the self. So the verbal form for Alfred um, presented in the present progressive, continuing, um, unfinalized, as he says, ongoing, uh, unfinished, I think we might do well to examine the unfinished project and the dormant uh, power and potential in his poetics at a moment when the rhetoric um, of so many progressives today, right, rather than conservatives, has assumed the guise of the monological, the essentialist, the reified of simple demarcations uh, that Alfred's writing so actively and so beautifully uh, disrupts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. You, you really bring forward what I always thought of as Alfred's motto, which was instead of soy chicano, it was always ando chicando, which I thought was perfect. Anyway, our next speaker, um, Laura Perez. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you, David. I just have to say one thing. I don't ever think that saying soy chicano ever meant for him or any other Chicanos anything essentialist or reified. I just really need to say that. Um, I also just want to thank um, you, David, uh, for uh, organizing this and the incredible care that you took in putting together his uh, posthumous poems. And, and then as everyone else has pointed out, this very beautiful book, which is truly such a, clearly a labor of, of your friendship and your care. Um, David and Alfred were once upon a time in Berkeley, fellow poet and scholars and rebel mates uh, at the university's English department. Second, I want to greet Alfredo. Saludos. Saludos, saludos. Que estés bien, Alfredo. Sigues entre nosotros. Alfred, now one with our ancestors, now one of the ancestors. I want to present something very short, I hope, called La Red del Espíritu, desde los abuelex a Aslan, the ancestral web from Mictlan to Alfred. The pre-colonial indigenous poetic ancestors of Alfred, a Chicanex poet and scholar, Tlamatini sage and Tlacuilo painter scribe were central interlocutors of Alfred's poem, Nesa Hualcoyoto in Mitlan, the second of three parts of the last book he published while alive, the powerful, haunting, enigmatic, tour de force, frozen accident of 2006 published two years before his final journey to Mictlan, this final journey to the underworld, the other world, place of rest, place of the desencarnados, of the no longer enfleshed, the ancestors, is also the theme of this cycle of four narrative poems, Nezhualcoyoto in Mictlan. I read Frozen Accident, in which that poem appeared, shortly after it was published, and I read it with the same excitement I had read Cesar Vallejo's enigmatic, multilingual, neologism-rich Trilce, 
that is with a knowledge that though I could not grasp everything at that moment, that it was nonetheless real and an act of virtuosity. I wanna talk a little bit about Frozen Accident as a conversation with the elders, with Chicanx poetry's ancestors, with Mesoamerican philosopher, poet kings, Nesnoto and Tochi Huitzin, Goyol Shikui, and others of that place and time, the late 15th century, that the self-named Chicano movement generation discovered in Spanish and probably even more so in English translation of works such as those of Miguel Leon Portilla on Aztec pre-colonial poetry and the broader Mesoamerican philosophy conveyed through it. Key aesthetic and philosophical ideas that many Chicano movement generation poets shared and explored are the foundation of Nezahualcoyoto in Mitlan. Two concepts in particular shape the poem, Floricanto, aka Inquicuitol in Social, Aka'a, aka Song Flower, that is the poetic philosophical intuition that human life is like a flower whose life is short, but that through song art, beautiful. Through song flower, the poet can reach through time to remember and in so doing perhaps immortalize the beloved who are no longer with us. And through song flower, the Tlamatini sage Tlaquilo poet can reach toward lasting truths about being, even when we can no longer material form. In contemplating, as Alfred writes in the first verses of the poem, quote, the interior of zero, soft, fleshy, palpable, no. An interior from which to radiate original synthesis. Whole zero offering up proof of God in its fact between water and between the waters. One whole zero Catholic in its immaculate cipher, first synthesis, origin of encircled sign." End of quote. In traditional and still living Mesoamerican thought, death is unlike modern Western conceptions of it, especially atheist and materialist notions opining that there is no afterlife. So-called death is the place of repose, of sleep and rest, the house of the now disincarnate, the place where our ancestors dwell. This poem constituting the second part of Frozen Accident is organized around the four cardinal colors of Mesoamerican indigenous color, naming the four poems that compose it. The cycle begins in the east with the first poem red, followed by yellow in the south, then black in the east, and ending with the white of the north, that for our Alfred was the white of Miklan. Two geometric forms conceptually shape the poem, the graph or grid or cross or square or whatever we name the relationship between the four cardinal points that describe in Mesoamerican thought, incarnation, the human. The second shape or concept is the point, the circle, the rich presence of the seeming absence that is the zero, the circle of infinity, wholeness, completeness, synthesis. The first poems engage these two shapes and concepts, which together, the square and the circle, capture the halfness of the human, our materiality and our spirit, the invisible presence. In this poem, Nezualcoyoto in Mictlan, Alfred's prior scholarly poetic meditations on hybridity, mestizaje, and a related aesthetics captured by Floricanto and by the non-Western logic of the diaphragm. That creation of the third from two other items that call it into being, such as floor, so, flower song, which signifies the poetic, becomes fully philosophical and thus enters fully into dialogue across time and space with the spirit present in the philosophical poems of Nezahualcoyoto and his poetic kin, the glyph makers, those of the black and the red ink. The poem ends with the poet led across the waters by a Charon-like guide, gato, cat, then led by one who speaks the language of the dead, Sheritzin, and a pale dog to the end of a black island, a black city. 
before facing the final unknown, the crossing to a deeper other side, the poet will pass the Clamatini, the sage figured by Aristotle, who will meditate the meaning of meaning of all points made and captured by the point as a mark, as a zero of aperture to infinity and mystery rather than closure, emptiness, nothingness. He will affirm to Equis, the poet and poet protagonist, quote, know this, you come to life in the cantos I sing, your acts, your body, so many petals lying on white sand, gain color, but not fact. In the poems, your line, its cross, and the points it divides are simple fact and not true. For it is the flower and the song that marks the soul zero, that marks difference, not one." End of quote. The next and final stop of the narrative journey, the final section called White of this, this four-part cycle is Marie Uguay, the poet. Beyond sagely disquisition, and as we saw, the logical conclusion or the need of philosophy represented by Aristotle as the search for truth is the poet. In the search and philosophical thought of Mesoamerica, even the material world, like all forms of being, change, transform. The poet in contemplating the flower is the one who most intuitively knows quote unquote truth. Resting amid the snow and yet revived through kiss, Marie Uguay, the poet, speaks to Equis's guide, Cheritzin, saying in French, which I translate, his body is a fixed point and sings to him, I carry you in your historical silences beyond the whole wave, the dead, the real, cradled, coded by the infernal whiteness of the day, end of quote. Through Alfred, through Leon Portilla and others who translated and recirculated the Nahua words of Nezahualcoyotl and other pre-Columbian poets, they in their heartfelt thought, in their yearnings, intuitions, meditations and understandings are revivified. Their pictographic marks woven in Alfred like or as equis, tlacuiloco of floricanto, now quote, live only in the inks, in the red and the black, end of quote. In Alfred's quote, codices, where bodies truly animate, come to life in the cantos he sings, end of quote. Colors, if not facts, where quote, simple facts are not true, for it is the flower and the song that marks the soul zero, that marks difference, not one, end of quote. Can one be dead yet alive, absent yet present, seemingly invisible, yet beneath the dawning light, drawn back into some color, some shape? Alfred Arteaga, poeta y teórico, scholar and poet, witness to a form called Chicanex presente. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. And thank you for beginning what I hope will be a whole body of work on that poem. It's it's astonishingly haunting poem that I hope everybody now will go and read. Thank you. And then uh, last but absolutely not least, uh, Ricky Rodriguez, who I really want to thank for helping me so much in putting this panel together, but also in putting the book together as a whole. And of course, Ricky, for sharing so many memories of Alfred with me over the years. Over to you, Ricky. Thank you, David. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for bringing us all together and for making this happen. Um, it's uh, really important, I think, uh, not just for me, but for everyone involved. And I've also noticed that um, Sochi and um, Marisol, uh, Alfred's daughters, are joining us today. So I just wanted to acknowledge them and uh, say hello. It's been years since I saw them. And, I'm really happy that we could be here. So I'm not going to say much. I just, I was thinking a lot about what I wanted to say. And, you know, I could talk at length about Alfred as a mentor, Alfred really getting me to where I am now. Uh, but, um, and then also some really great uh, personal stories. Uh, 
Uh, but there's one thing that I want to focus on, and I just have something real quick to read. Uh, but I remember meeting Alfred after a lecture he gave uh, during the inaugural year of Other Voices, which was a one unit course created to showcase the writing and scholarship of faculty of color at Berkeley. And Alfred spoke about his birth in East LA, growing up in Whittier, writing for Chicano movement newspapers, uh, studying creative writing at Columbia, and getting and earning his PhD in literature at Santa Cruz. I also recalled Diana Spinoza, my TA for the course, introducing us at the end of his lecture. After some customary small talk, Alfred wrote his phone number on a piece of notebook paper and told me to call him so we could set up a time to chat. I was kind of surprised by this, you know, as this 19 year old kid and he, you know, kind of it was just really um, open and um, engaging and not wasting any time. I rang him up the next day and we set up a time to meet for lunch. Uh, being my usual awkward and insecure self, I think maybe I've gotten over that a little bit now that I've gotten older. Uh, um, I was a little nervous around him at first, but it became clear that in his company, I didn't have to pretend to be anyone but myself um, as a, a sharp, witty and brilliant as he was. Alfred was a no nonsense kind of person. And for as much as he took his work seriously, he never put on airs nor bought into the belief that he was better as a result of his status as a professor. Uh, and that was something that I really admired and it kind of set the stage for how I wanted to um, imagine myself as a professor. Uh, from that lunch meeting on, he became a friend whose example I still aim to follow. Now I could go on at length recounting some great Alfred stories, not to mention divulging some fantastic gossip uh, to which I was privy over beers and tacos. Um, and kind of in what Jose was saying, he always treated you know, he always took his students out to, to eat coffee, beer, you know, it was like, wow, man, this is cool. And I try to do the same thing with my students. Um, but I do want to focus um, real briefly on the one thing that he taught me to be, and that's a, a poet. Uh, during my second year at Berkeley, uh, I began taking poetry workshops and imagined myself going on to obtain an MFA and um, just as Alfred did after completing my degree. And with the encouragement of a visiting writer, Yusuf Kuminaka, I began to consider various programs to apply for and honing my craft as a poet. Alfred, however, believed that I could um, still write poetry while working toward a PhD. And I'll never forget how he told me that I had a better shot at paying my bills as a professor than as a poet uh, whose employment prospects might prove somewhat more difficult. But he also encouraged me, uh, well, he encouraged me to apply to Santa Cruz for graduate school, and I attribute my acceptance and decision to attend Santa Cruz to him. Uh, but at the same time, Alfred regarded me as a fellow poet. He invited me to read alongside Leonard de Cervantes and Luis Rodriguez at the Mod Five room uh, in Wheeler Hall. And this was undoubtedly one of the highlights of my time as an undergrad. And that, al that event alone continues to serve as the source that I return to when I doubt myself as a writer. So while my status as a poet proper has ebbed and flowed over the years, I'd like to think that my work as a whole is informed by my poet self, that Alfred identified, nurtured, and supported. Last year during a trip to the British Library, it occurred to me when scratching out a poem in a cafe that Alfred had been in London decades earlier, writing poems like The Small Sea of Europe from Cantos. Now, this recollection illuminated once more how he paved the way for me, his mentee and fellow Chicano poet, in ways that I can't forget and will continue to remember. And after all, Alfred's presence, just like his poetry, um, the poetry that David has helped uh, bring into print um, so we can recirculate once more, uh, that poetry remains timeless. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm feeling tremendously moved. And um, yeah, Alfred Presente, um, I can, you know, feel like how he materializes in everybody's speech and the book is part of that, but I think Alfred lives on in the way we all learn from him and think about him. And with that said, I, I want to follow Ricky in saying the book itself is dedicated as Cantos was um, para sus hijas. And I too want to acknowledge that uh, Marisol, Mireya, and Soshi are, I think, still in the audience today. Um, this is not to put you on the spot or put you on the stage, but just to thank you, because I really know how much you all meant to Alfred and that his dedications successively, book by book, were part of his deep love for you all. And I thank you for allowing me to 
have the privilege of editing the work and taking a look at manuscripts and all the ways in which you help me. And uh, I, I dedicate the book to you insofar as I'm entitled to do so. Thank you. I want to open up um, the whole uh, session now to everybody who wants to participate, including if panelists want to speak to one another, um, however you like to go ahead. Anybody who wishes to um, can just uh, put a, a question or a comment in the chat, um, or you can all unmute and come on video. I'm going to turn off the recording at this juncture. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not turning off the recording yet. Um, you are being recorded, is what I meant to say. Um, and this will go up on YouTube. Um, but I will be closing off the recorded session quite soon um, because there are some limits to how much the ASA wishes to host for, for one uh, event or panel on the Freedom Courses. But let's, let's keep going for at least another 10 minutes, and then we can open it just to a free-form conversation without recording. If I can just jump in very briefly, I just, uh, when you said that Alfred materializes with each person's speech, I just feel really um, enormous amount of uh, gratitude, you know, to what everybody presented. I was, I'm very moved and um, really appreciate um, this sense of his presence, you know, I think, uh, is they a lot of really made that evident that, that that's the work here, you know, and um, people said such such really great things and um, Ricky saying the thing about the that it's the poet self that, that you think made you a, a better teacher, better academic, better professor. That's exactly right. You know, I wish we could teach all our students that that their best self is the artist self, the poet self. And I think that Alfred's generosity stemmed from that as a teacher and as a friend. So I'm just, I just feel very, a lot of gratitude. Thank you all very much. And thank for all the people that are there present. Um, you're probably feeling as I do. So um, anyway, just gracias a todos. Yeah, I just want to add that one of the things I felt constantly while I was editing was regret of not having asked Alfred all kinds of things or talked to him about all kinds of things. And I have to say that the, the vividness of people's memories of Alfred makes up for that to some extent. You know, the, the sense of the complexity, emotional complexity and intellectual complexity of, of Alfred's way of being in the world just, just comes across in, in your reminiscences. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I do also want to say that the experience of editing him that was part of that wishing I had talked to him more was also just the discovery of what I sort of knew. But, you know, you get a book and you read it and you love it and then you put it aside and then you get the next book from a poet and you read it and you love it and you put it aside. And having the opportunity to kind of think the poetry as a whole made me realize that although I'd always known he was really a great poet, I hadn't realized just what a body of work it is. That, I think, I can't remember who mentioned this, but the consistency from volume to volume, the way they build, but also never stay the same. They keep changing, he keeps discovering new things. And that has to do, I'm sure, with his sense that I think Craig mentioned of his Poetry is process. Poetry is this constant discovery and being about becoming rather than about asserting a being or an essence. And to go back to what Dorothy was, was talking about, it was astonishing that a literature department couldn't see that, that he got saddled with the idea of being an identity poet, whatever that means. 
and and that you know one of our colleagues could say that his kind of Chicano nationalism led to things like the Balkans, you know, the sort of cliche that people were mouthing at the time out of the New York Times. It's so far from anything that Alfred's work represented, his critical work or his poetry. And I'm just glad that, that um, the work is now out there for people really to see and to dwell on and to, that it's now, thanks to Wesleyan, available to, um, to everybody who, who wants to see it. Because of course, you know, Alfred published as the best poets do in small presses and, you know, supporting independence. And um, that meant that the books were not as widely circulated as they might've been. But I will say that, that um, one of the real pleasures of it was discovering people all around the world who knew his work in Italy, in Japan, in France. You know, it's just that internationalism was about his ability just to be somewhere and to be with whoever was there. And I know that from people who knew him actually in that trip to Sligo that Melissa was alluding to in, in um, House with the Blue Bed. Anyway, I just uh, hope that, you know, people on the panel or, or beyond the panel want to chip in and say what they recall and what they think about the poetry. I'll, I'll say, I'll jump in and say something because I was probably a little nervous and talked really fast and <laughs> the first time around that, you know, I, I, you know, a couple of things, something that Shetty wrote and uh, forward too was needing time, I think, with this, with this work, um, giving yourself time to let the poetry enter you, right? Um, and also thinking about how, you know, when I'm, look, when I, as soon as we receive these copies in the mail, I just sat there and I just wanted to go through everything, you know, but there we are having to teach online and do all kinds of other things that we had to worry about. And so I actually relished, you know, I, I did take about a month and a half, well, however long we had the book, about a month to, to really just kind of relish it and you know what I he's a poet and, and I know that we're celebrating his work as a poetry but I really did feel drawn to his prose and his essays you know and some of the more beautiful lines it just really I felt really arrested you know or I felt like someone's jolting me you know and like I'm reading something for the first time even though it's like not new and you know one of the lines I, I lost it now and you know I wish I probably should find it again but one of the lines that really struck me was, was one of the stories that he's telling about uh, celebrating the living, even in the face of killing. You know, and, and those are the lines, you know, you don't realize how you can be affected by, you know, by words and poetry, but those of us who are here, the English majors, the writers, the poets, the artists, you know, being taken um, kind of caught off guard by the beauty uh, and but the intensity of, of his words and, and how prescient his writing was and, and also how terribly relevant and resonant it is now when we read about the police, for example, uh, and his daughter, um, when we read about, again, the border crossings, when we read about affirmative action, you know, it, it feels like there's so much resonance and it feels like he's here uh, with us, uh, walking us through that again. So I just wanted to, again, express my gratitude uh, for, for his work and, and for those of you who are here and for David for putting it all together for us, because this is a volume, I think, so many of us as scholars, I feel like we need to mine this work. You know, we need to come back to it because there's so much there and we can continue to make these new transnational connections, use these connections, you know, outside of Aslan, for example, but uh, using where we are as this, uh, you know, particular perspective. So um, thank you again to Alfred, wherever you are. Can I just say a, a thanks to everybody and especially Dr. Lloyd, thank you. This is media, by the way, Alfred's youngest daughter. My older sisters, I think are hiding out uh, in the crowd, but thank you so much to, to everybody for being here and in, inviting us to take part in this and hear a side of our father that honestly, I didn't know very well. I think I know a bit of my father as kind of like an academic, but I certainly didn't know him as, um, you know, as, 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 as he was in his professional capacity. So it's, it's lovely to hear um, what, what we know to be true of him is like a, an individual and he was just very encouraging as a father. And he was really just a champion of, of all the things that, that we did in life. And it sounds like he's really, you know, he's really kind of bled that into his, 
his professional life. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that and how, how much he's um, impacted everyone. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for, for doing this for my dad and for including us as well. Thank you, Mariah. And thank you for inspiring House with the Blue Bed. <laughs> thank you, guys. Hello. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but David and I will be co-editing a dossier on Alfred's work for um, the journal Last Land. Uh, so, um, you know, look, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation in the pages of the journal um, and discussing his work and his, his profound influence. Thanks so much to all the panelists for this um, really incredible session, and especially to David and to Wesleyan and to Cherie for this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Alfred taught me how to take walks. Uh, for all kinds of reasons that aren't worth going into, I was really a lousy walk taker. And um, Alfred started teaching at Berkeley in my last semester there as a grad student. And one day I was walking out of Wheeler after just teaching a class to undergraduates. And we sort of knew each other a little. And he said to me, uh, what do you just do? And I said, I actually just taught some of your poetry. I had just gotten my hands uh, weeks before on the, that first edition of the Cantos and they just blew my mind. And of course, they opened up everything for the students in the class in terms of how you could enter poetry and how poetry could enter you. And um, he said, oh yeah, who'd you teach me with? Uh, with that smile of his. And I said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah. And I said, Sor Juana Cesar Vallejo and Rosario Castellanos. And he said, no me mierdes. We're going to take a walk and have a cerveza. Let's make a date. And over the years, walking with him, I learned how to take walks. He would just get lost and just be in heaven at being lost. And I had, I think he was the first person I met, I'd read about people like this, but he was the first person I met with absolute militancy and absolute openness about everything, including his own opinions of how to achieve justicia. So he was always revising that. And that was how he taught me how to walk. You just kept looking at where you were getting lost and learning from it. And in hearing all of you talk about the work and talk about the, him, Every single second, I felt like he was right there in front of all of us. Um, I could see him, I could hear him. And I also realized that because of what you're all saying, but also because of this incredible job David and Sherry and the press did, we're gonna have him on the page and in the air forever. And so will so many other generations of people, of readers, of other poets that will discover the work. And, that will change the world over and over again. Thank you all so much. I have a really short question. Does um, Alfred have grandchildren? Yeah, he does. He has. One, two, three is four, four grandchildren. One, um, yeah, he has four. And their names? Uh, Sadie, James, Eos are mine, and Sochi has Dali. Well, then it's just good to know that he's, his That's DNA it. continues. <laughs> yeah, we, we frequently talk about, I mean, my, my, the two oldest remember, remember my dad? He was, he was around when they were younger. They have memories and we show them pictures and videos quite a bit. Um, but the two younger ones don't don't have a memory of our, our dad. They didn't um, get to meet him, but we do mention him quite a bit. So they they've still got the connection. We show them pictures. Mm -hmm. Thank I was muted and I was saying maybe the silence, maybe the silence is 
uh, the appropriate place to end at least this recorded session. Um, as I announced at the beginning, it will be posted for people's uh, future watching pleasure um, on the air, to quote back Rob Kaufman, um, it will be on the air uh, for the future and for posterity. But now I'm going to end the recording and anybody who wishes to stay on the Zoom um, can join in casual, unrecorded and explicit conversation about Alfred, maybe if you have it handy with a cerveza or a glass of wine too. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for everybody's remarks in the chat. Thank you especially to the panelists. And once again, thank you to our wonderful ASL interpreters, Tricia and William. Thank you. Thank you.